the show on the road. Are you guys ready to enjoy some good cask beer? All right. All right, so tonight we have a, a pleasure not only of enjoying some very special, wonderful beers um, in one of my favorite formats, uh, having them on cask. And as our special guest here tonight, we are honored to have Damien McCann, the head brewer from Summit Brewing here. So he's going to here to tell us all everything you might want to know about cask beer, about life, what it all means. A fountain of useless information. Yes, <laughs> not not true, not true. Um, so yes, we're we're going to be learning uh, quite a bit about that. Uh, kind of questions as they come up. We'll also have a little bit of time at the end to kind of uh, pick his brain about about cask beer, about some uh, general brewing stuff as well. Um, think about this too. If you've ever, uh, if you're a home brewer. The idea of cask beer and conditioning should be something you're kind of familiar with, so it might be something to consider maybe doing as a home brewer, maybe do some cask beer at home. Um, so I think uh, without further ado, we're gonna we'll get the beers pouring here in a moment. We're gonna have two cask beers tonight, and then two non-cask beers. Um, we'll try to address those as they're coming through. It's gonna be an all summit night, but a wide range of flavors um, and a good wealth of knowledge. So uh, let's get it going here. Kick it off with Damien, and let's get started. I worked for Summit for about uh, 11 years in various capacities. Um, research brewer, uh, new product development, process brewer. I've been head brewer for about the last two years. Uh, before that, I worked for a small brew pub in uh, Mini Tonka called Sherlock's Home. And before that, I worked for um, a small outfit based out of Dublin, Arthur Guinness and Sons. Um, they make a rather <laughs> mediocre um, black beer that no one really drinks anymore. Uh, I uh, studied brewing science for five years in the UK, uh, and I'm originally from uh, Indiana. We'll pick Indiana this one. At the last uh, presentation, I said Iowa, but uh, we're going to go with Indiana for tonight. I'm uh, just outside Dublin, County Kildare, where Arthur Guinness, God rest his soul, was born. So um, I'm going to wander around a little bit. Uh, the cameraman here is going to love me because I tend to go off the reservation. We're going to start out with a very basic definition of what a cast scale is. And uh, rather than me tell you what it is, I'm going to find out what you think it might be. So what do you think of when you think of cast scale, here, boss? I don't know. I think of a beer in a wooden barrel. Beer in a wooden barrel. OK. That's good. Someone, someone's 
bloody hate technology. What does it say over there? We'll see how inaccurate it is. Unfiltered and unpasteurized say beer. It, say it for the masses there, brother. Unfiltered Unpil or unpasteurized beer, which is conditioned. Blah, blah, blah. Come on, technology. Let's get a move on here. Oh, that looks kind of nice. <laughs> Look at those pretty firkins. Serve from the cask without additional Ooh. nitrogen or carbon dioxide pressure. Gas ale may also be referred to as real ale. Okay, we, yeah. What is that? Thing? Bloody wicked. <laughs> All right. In the 1970s, in the UK, there was a growing movement towards pasteurized, filtered, centrifuged, dull, lifeless keg beer. A lot of it was lager beer, but a hell of a lot of it was ale. It was a famous brand called Watney's Red Barrel. It's truly bloody awful. Um, there are still tales told about just how mediocre and how crappy it was. So an organization called Camera was created. Camera stands for the Campaign for Real Ale. Uh, Camera was created in 1973 with the main goal of um, educating people and educating society in general in the UK about traditional British beer. They started pushing forward the idea of what they called real ale, what we would now know today as cask conditioned ale or cask beer. Very simply, according to the geniuses of the Oxford English Dictionary, it's beer that's uh, brewed from traditional ingredients and it's matured and served from the cask or barrel from which it is served. It doesn't have to be wood when you're right. Traditionally for a long time it was, so it was the 1950s. Uh, it doesn't have to be cloudy, ideally it's not. Uh, it doesn't have to be really, really warm or really cold. Ideally, it's neither of those things. Uh, but cask beer is a living, breathing product. It is the antithesis of keg beer. Now, keg beer in the United States today is uh, the most common way of serving craft beers. So whether you're Summit or Sierra Nevada or uh, Liftbridge or Surly, chances are you serve the majority of your draft beer from kegs. That means you run that beer out of a fermenter through a centrifuge or a filter into a bright tank and then you package it into bottles, cans, or kegs. It's a little bit different with Cascale. Cascale is a living, breathing product. Instead of running it through a centrifuge or a filter, you rack it directly out of those fermenters or in the case of the UK, out of racking tanks into casks. And we have a couple of examples of different size casks here tonight. Um, the key is that when you run that beer, that green beer, that immature beer, out of those fermenters or those racking tanks, it contains a small amount of yeast still in suspension, and also it has some residual sugar um, to assist with a second fermentation in that actual cask. Um, and also it's at the correct temperature. You don't want to rack that beer too cold. The yeast will stay passive and do sweet FA in those casks. And if you rack it too warm, you get some off flavors from the yeast. So two main ways of making cask ale. One is the standard version in the UK, which relies on what's known as residual gravity for carbonation. So the Brits, the likes of Fuller's, Green King, Adams, Shepherdine, and even the uh, exciting boys of Brewdog up in Scotland. What they'll do is when they rack that green beer off, they leave a small amount of residual sugar in the beer. So the yeast goes to town on the residual sugars, and it's in the cask, creates a second fermentation in that cask. The beer increases in carbonation, changes in flavor quite a bit. We got a lot more balance, uh, the beer matures, and becomes pretty drinkable. In the US, we don't do that. For the most part, US craft brewers don't make enough, he's not paying attention. US craft brewers don't make enough cast beer um, where they can rely on residual gravity from rack and tanks. 
to provide enough sugar for that second fermentation. They prime their cats. That's all we do with some of it as well. So take, we, take, we take a priming solution and we add it to the cast around. Go ahead there, Finchie. Yes, yeah, since, you, since you're talking about Summit Cast Beer, what can you tell us about what people are drinking right now? I have no idea. What, what are people drinking? Oatmeal Stout. Well, I'm only kidding. Um, the Oatmeal Stout is a uh, draft only beer from Summit. We don't produce it in bottles. Um, it's a mixed gas nitro beer. Uh, it's low CO2 to begin with. And then we rely on uh, injecting nitrogen into the kegs at the racking head to give it that nice surge, that cascade effect. And that technology was developed by Guinness in the 1950s. Uh, they are the world's leading experts on mixed gas dispense for beers. We don't do it um, for our bottle beer because we don't have the technology to handle mixed gas beers on our bottle. Right? We don't have an inline nitrogenator. We don't have the widgets that Guinness have developed over the years, or Murphy's, or Beamish. So it's only available on draft. We occasionally, though, will offer the beer uh, cast condition. So as we send wort from the brew house over to those big cylindroconical fermenters, we'll pull a small amount off, and we'll send that into um, smaller tanks that basically exist as yeast propagation vessels. But occasionally, they'll double up for cask beer production. Um, and then we'll rack the green beer, kind of similar to how the Brits do it. We'll rack the green beer off um, those uh, two small uh, yeast propagators, add some priming sugar, and go from there. So um, the oatmeal stout, it's a, it's a lovely beer. And it's made with uh, a lot of ingredients imported from the UK, but unfortunately we don't offer it on, uh, in package. It's only offered on draft. So it's nice to have it tonight. I, I really like it on cask. It's, you know, oatmeal stouts are traditionally served in Scotland. Um, the Scots uh, like sweeter beers in general. They're basically too cheap to buy hops. That's the only reason. They, they're cheap bastards over there in Scotland. They really are. Um, no, I, I, they, I think it matches the climate. I think the, the sweeter, heftier beers work probably better for the for the weather. And it's even crappier in Scotland than it is in Ireland. Um, it's, the weather is miserable over there. That's why they drink all that whiskey. Um, but, but oatmeal stouts uh, in general serve more in Scotland than, say, in England, or certainly the dry Irish styles in, uh, in Scotland. Fine looking individual with his hand up there at the back. I'm just curious when you're, when you're trying to cast it and, 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 and use residual gravity, what kind of percentage of your desired specific gravity are you going for? So, say you have a 12 degree Playmobil beer, 1048, as you'd say back home, and the final gravity of that beer is a two and a half Play-Doh, which is 1010. What a lot of British breweries will do is ensure there's half a degree Play-Doh of residual gravity left at the end of that primary fermentation. So they'll, they'll actually put the coolers on, they'll chill down that tank, um, at about three degrees Play-Doh. And that half degree P that's left uh, in terms of sugar in that green beer will be enough to kickstart a secondary fermentation in the cask. And that's, it's a very good question, you're, you're dead right. It's very difficult to do that if you're not making a lot of cask beer on a regular basis. You have to know the precise final gravity of your beers. You have to have the ability to turn on those cooling jackets at precisely the right time. But then you have to also ensure you don't you don't uh, drop that yeast out of suspension. The minute you start cooling down that that uh, green beer, and most British breweries will rack green beer at about uh, 55 degrees, that yeast will start dropping out of suspension. If you've got too much yeast, you'll end up with fairly hazy beer. And not enough yeast, you don't get that second fermentation. So the rule of thumb, half degree Play-Doh, residual gravity, or enough priming solution to get up to about half a P. And then you've got to work out, okay, I need half, you know, for, for a firkin you might need one pint of 20 Play-Doh wort to buy with some fresh yeast. So it's a little tricky to manage. That's why the Brits have been so good at it for so long. You have to remember too that Fuller's Green King these larger regionals in the UK, 
They make three, four hundred thousand barrels of cask beer a year. Their whole operations are designed around producing cask in Michigan. You know, it is the traditional way of serving and maturing beer in the UK. Um, largely falling out of favor everywhere else because it's so labor intensive. So, how are the beer station days? Which it? I want to wrap this cord around this man here and try not to kill him. <laughs> Sorry, boss. We're going to switch it out for the, the beer here. I lose my beloved mallet. So we'll talk a little bit about um, second fermentation um, and some of the additions that we make when we actually rack those casks. I mentioned how we're going to take that green beer still immature, we're going to rack it into um, some size of cask or other. There's a couple of different options. Oh, the most common size of cask used in both the US and the UK today is the 11 gallon firkin. It's 11 US gallons, it's 9 imperial gallons. And my friend here in front of me is going to assist. God bless you, lady. You're a good man. This is a, uh, it's a French cask. So every time I put an English style of beer in there, everything goes to bloody hell in the hand basket. It's a terrible idea. Oh, Jesus, they just call 911 every time. It's amazing. Anytime there's an issue with the fermentation, they, they call it up. Um, this is a, a 9 UK gallon, 11 US gallon firkin. Um, Firkin comes from the Dutch word firkin, which means fourth or quarter. And there's four of these babies in a UK barrel. Um, when we rack that green beer that I talked about, we rack it through what's known as the shive opening right here. I'm going to send around a couple of bongs here. I know you all love bongs, so let's send them around. So a lot of the terms used to describe casks um, and barrels in general, they're all based around old Cooper's terms for working with wooden casks. So when you look at this, this firkin right here, you can break it down into various components. This area up at the top is called the chime, upper chime. There's also a lower chime. Normally casks are stillaged or cellared on their sides like this. They're stillaged horizontally, just like our firkin of saggage right there. This is called the bilge, right here. Same as the bilge of a ship. And that's where all of the yeast material, all of the, the, uh, the hops that we'd add to the cask and rack, and all of the finings would settle. And then we'd pour the brighter beer through this opening here. This is a real blast to do this, by the way, while you're holding the microphone. Um, then we serve the beer through what's known as the keystone opening right here. So a lot of these terms have just been used for a long time. They've transferred over to, uh, to modern cast production, uh, mainly because of history and tradition. Uh, this is a 304 stainless steel cask. Uh, originally, it would have been oak. Uh, then they started using aluminium, not aluminum. That's a completely different product that's spelled incorrectly. Uh, but nowadays, the, the, uh, the material of choice is stainless steel. You'll still see some, um, some plastic firkins around. Uh, avoid those things like the plague. They have a nasty habit of splitting when you tap them. Um, they're also uh, uh, not so hot when it comes to uh, being clean. They don't like hot, high temperature cleaning solutions. So as a result, you can't get them clean, you can't get them sanitary, and they're, they're a little bit notorious for producing effective beer. Um, always go with the stainless, can't go wrong. The, uh, the little brother of the firkin is the, get your attention, is the uh, five and a half gallon pin. These are great for beer festivals, uh, tastings. I have a bar in my basement where I have two push beers and one cask beer, because that's what brewers do. Uh, <laughs> And I usually have a pin on. Um, it, it's nice. You can, you can, if you're a home brewer, especially, you can do a five-gallon batch, rack it into a pin, uh, make your additions through the uh, shy opening, and uh, as the saying goes, Bob is your 
I would say your uncle, but more like your aunt's husband. So, um, firkins, pins, four firkins in a barrel. For the love of God, don't ever try and manhandle a barrel on your own. They weigh more than Ian and I combined, and Ian's a pretty heavy guy. Um, let's be honest, he looks pretty heavy. Right? It's only because you keep making all this damn beer. Well, someone's got to drink it, brother. Right. So, a couple of things that we're going to add at the point of rack to our firkins and pens. Uh, the nicest thing, we're going to start off with the nice stuff and kind of finish with the nastier stuff. Um, the nicest thing we, we're going to add, in addition to maybe a priming solution, are our hops. Um, we've got some samples of mosaic in front of you. Uh, the cask of saga behind me is also dry hop and mosaic. So, what we're going to do is we're going to get you doing some rubbing. What we're going to do, folks, take a wee amount of the, of the mosaic, cup them between your hands like this, and rub the BJs out of the clock. Rub. Here we go. Rub it up top, three men in the top. No beer to drink. Oh, wow. Here we go. Good and hot. Cast condition beer. Conditions at about 55 degrees for about a week. During that process, That's very those busy. nice holy pops that you've added to your firkin, they're really going to produce a lot of aroma and flavor. So we're going to do it in about five minutes when we'll take normally you have a meal. one of those firkins. So when you rub it, you get all those oils breaking down with that heat in your hands. You want to cup the sample? Get the old schnozzle there. You need to get your nose in. Come on, you've done it before. It's just a little bit whiter. Come on, get in there. <laughs> 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 the hops. <laughs> When brewers perform hop selection in Yakima every year in September, they'll do this with literally dozens of different lots and dozens of varieties. And they'll actually pick the hop they want based on this analysis that you're doing right now. I had to choose from 10 different lots of Cascade back in September. Just doing this process. And seven of them were crap, so I'm glad I picked the other three. <laughs> Your hand analysis from your rub to what you get in the final beer. It's one of the great things about cask beer. You can make additions to the actual cask itself. And it really allows for more of those fresh flavors and aromas to come through. Cask beer is a living, breathing product. The key to it is freshness and balance and flavor. One of the key attributes, one of the key contributions to flavor is the holy pot. Pellets. pellets can break down and form kind of a, a powdery mass inside the cask. And as a result, you can end up with some fairly nasty hazes in the final beer. Traditionally in the UK, they use whole leaf hops for dry hopping. It's a, a less processed form of the hop. We've got less off flavors. Unfortunately, it takes longer for those aromas to come through. We're now in the best smelling room in the Twin Cities, by the way. We've dry hopped the room. Yeah. Smells pretty good, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is a huge part of, of making cast beer. You gotta love the dry hop. So I mentioned that when we rack the beer, we rack that green beer, we have some yeast in suspension because we need that yeast to perform a second fermentation and maturation step in the cask. Well, we, we want to get that yeast out of there. We don't want the yeast in the glass. Cask beer should never be served flat. It should have a noticeable low amount of carbonation. It should never be served hazy. It's not a bloody hefeweizen. It should never be served warm. It should have a certain degree of coolness to it. It should be about 50 to 55 degrees. But we need to get that yeast and those proteins out of suspension. We don't want the beer to be pretty hazy. You had a question over there, sir. I was just wondering what the beer where you're just drinking. 
I have no idea. What, what are we drinking? Yeah. The beer we were... The, the, the second round. Yeah, the beer de garde was the second beer. So not... The one coming around right now is some winter ale. So traditionally in the UK, they've employed a finding agent, a natural clarifying agent, to help remove that yeast and protein material. They've been doing that for about 300 years. Um, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington were both fairly accomplished porter brewers. Uh, these boys both like to use uh, clarifying agents to help remove the yeast in their beers. So even back then they were starting to figure this stuff out. In summer we use two types of finding agent. Um, first is called alginex. It's based on plant polysaccharides. And while the mosaic tasted or smells, it tastes pretty good too. Just try to eat it While the uh, the mosaic smells really good, the alginex is going to smell pretty sulfur. So we're just going to have you guys pass it around. So alginex is a clarifying agent based around plant polysaccharides. When you smell it, you're going to get a strong sulfur note. That's what the SO2 uses as a reserve. Don't put your nose right over the bottle. What the brewers are doing stage is they add this product to the beer. <laughs> nice. Ah, yeah. What, what, what did you have in your fridge? You have the waft. It's in the garden. Ocho mole. It grabs onto the proteins in the beer and helps drag the proteins out of suspension into the bilge and the cask so that they don't present themselves as chilies. This is for when you want a really, really bright, really, really clear beer. We don't use it for our darker beers like stout or, or winter ale, there's no real point. But if you're making a, a cask of summer ale or, or EPA, it really helps to use this stuff. It will drag those proteins out of solution. It's a natural product based around plants. The sulfur oil you're getting is just a preservative. Um, so that's added in the racking tank before the beer is racked. And then as we rack the beer into the cask, along with adding our hops, adding our priming solution, we add some white findings. This is icing glass. Fish letters. We're going to send around two different types of icing glass. One is a, a very fine product called a fine. And the other is a bit more coarse. Both in the UK. And uh, as I said, British brewers have been using this for at least 300 years, maybe longer. They're traditionally made from the swim bladders of surgeon fish. They're made out of collagen, this type of protein. They're incredibly effective at grabbing onto yeast and pulling that yeast out of suspension. Um, they've been used uh, for cask beer, primarily for clarification purposes. There's also an argument that they improve foam formation in beer. Um, that's probably a lot of bollocks, to be honest. I've never seen that really be proved by anyone. Um, but they are a great alternative to using a centrifuge or a filter. So if you go to the UK and you walk into that nice pub in London, you ask for a pint of fullers, I guarantee you it's been clarified with first Alginex and then Isinglass. Um, these are processing aids. They fall to the bottom of the cask, into the bilge, below the tap. They're completely harmless if you were to decide to chew on that stuff. It doesn't taste very good, but um, they're a, they're a food a food based process aid. They do really help with our fish. Amy, do you want to mention swapping out the sauce? Sure. Yeah, we can talk a little bit about venting and tapping. So we've made all of our additives, we've added the icing glass, we've added the priming solution, we've added the dry hops, we've driven in that shive bong, we've sealed everything up. The next case, uh, the next stage uh, is to allow that uh, cast to mature. Um, we ideally allow it to mature at about 50 to 58 degrees. It starts off in the brewery, it's then moved traditionally to the pub. Um, the argument is that about 35% of the work to make cask ale is performed at the pub. In the U.S. it's probably um, about 5% because most U.S. bars just don't have the cellars set up to do a lot of maturation. They're not designed for that. Um, so after a couple of days that beer will become more rounded. The second fermentation will kick in. The CO2 level will increase. Um, 
you'll get a huge reduction in, in hot flavors like diacetyl, sulfur dioxide, acid aldehyde. Um, the beer will noticeably round out. You get some nice yeast esters coming through, and uh, you know, we'll be in pretty good shape. So the next thing to do is to check the carbonation level, and we do that through venting. Excuse me, I think I'm pulling this. So we vent using different types of pegs or spirals. We start off, we start, we start off by, by using a soft spiral, a soft peg. I think they got that Oh, they probably had enough of that by now. God bless them. So I'm going to hand out a soft peg here. We'll call me on as a soft spile. S-P-I-L-E. These are made from bamboo. The, uh, the spile itself is porous. The grain is running vertically. And so when we initially vent the cask through that shy bone, there's an opening in the bone called the tux. You can drive that peg right through the tux. No, I, you're, that's, that's a very, very good question. You have to remember that all of these terms are based on uh, cooperage from 500 years ago. So coopers have very, very specific terms when it comes to working with barrels. Hence, shives, keystones, cantles, chimes, bilges. It's all based around medieval terms used by coopers. So, cask ale is a very traditional process in the UK, so we still retain that, that tut. Whole, whole is great, but whole is kind of, well, it, you know, it's not very creative. Um, tut sounds a little bit better. Um, and exactly how many holes might there be in the cask, right? So, we. Uh, we vent it through that tut, which is in the middle of the shave, and we allow some of that CO2 and that foam to escape through that porous soft spiral. Once we, we uh, stop seeing some of that foam and that CO2, we're pretty much at the right level of condition in the beer. When we talk about the condition in the beer, that means the amount of CO2 in there. When we talk about the condition of the beer, that means the flavor and aroma. So it's condition in, and condition off. And once we have pretty much figured out, okay, we've got enough CO2 in there, we've vented off some of that excess CO2. Uh, cask ale should be about half the CO2 of normal keg beers. Then we can switch to hard spile. This is a hard, non-porous spile right here. This one's made out of plastic, traditionally they were made out of timber. Pass that around there, boss. That'll form a complete seal against that plastic shiny foam. So it retains the CO2 in the beer, prevents uh, any kind of microbial contamination, prevents oxygen getting into the cask, and so we're all set. Uh, when you come to tap the cask, we usually have that hard spot in place. We'll drive the tap in right through the keystone right here. And we'll take off the insulation jacket so you can see it a wee bit better. One thing to remember if you're serving a beer out of a cask, um, whether it's a firkin or a pin, either put in a soft spile or remove the spile altogether. You'll create a vacuum. You won't be able to get any beer out of it. Um, if you're using a beer engine, actually, you'll actually suck the sides of the cask in if you pull hard enough on those engines. So, two traditional ways of serving cask beer. Uh, the most traditional is gravity, literally driving the tap through the key storm and uh, hammer away in terms of serving the beer. The other alternative is the beer engine that you see out in the bar. The engine is basically like a uh, basic water pump. Uh, it's connected by a, a brew line down to the basement through a, uh, it's known as an avid tap. The tap is driven into the cask, you hook up the brew line, remove your spile and 
start pulling your planks. That allows you to, to avoid moving the bloody things up and down flights of stairs. Before uh, you all arrived here, Rob and I dragged that thing up two flights of stairs. They weigh about 110 pounds. Um, so besides trying to avoid killing ourselves, you also want to avoid mixing up the contents of the cask. Remember how I said we use findings to help drop out all those proteins and yeast? Well, if we move it a lot before, just before we serve it, we're going to mix up the contents again, so we don't want to do that. Ideally, you leave the cask in place for a couple of days, and then you'll move it before you serve the beer out of it. So, uh, this is a basic nut and tail that hooks up to a beer line that goes to the engine out front and uh, you can pull away. Beer engines have been around since about the 1800s. Uh, a wonderful invention, they're pretty much bulletproof. Uh, and they've, they've come to epitomize cask beer in the UK. If you went to a pub in the UK, you'll pretty much see a beer engine or maybe five or six on the bar. Uh, they prefer to do that nowadays over certain like crab or so, uh, Any questions or comments, guys, on any aspect of cast beer production? It really, uh, the question was how long would cask ale age uh, in general? It depends on the OG of the beer. So say you had a 10, 40, uh, 10 Plato, best ordinary bitter, I suppose. Um, chances are you can you can fully mature that in the cask uh, in three to seven days. And so, if you had a heavily hopped IPA, maybe it takes two weeks. If you have a body line, carry it south, it's going to spend more time in the cask. It might take three months, it might take six months. It really depends on the OG of the beer. But in the UK in general, a lot of those draft cask ales are fairly low on alcohol. They're going to turn them over fairly sharpish. They'll probably move them in a week. And tops. You want to try and retain that freshness as much as possible. Cask ale in general is not designed for um, extended periods of aging. It really doesn't do that, that well after a couple of months. Are there specific styles of beer that you feel like work best um, being served on cask? Um, as maybe as opposed to being okay, or some that don't work so well being served on cask? Well, don't, don't sell your bloody check pills on cask, for God's sake. Um, <laughs> yeah, in general, the style uh, is, is kind of relegated towards uh, British and Irish ales, uh, maybe some Belgian beers. Uh, but I've seen, I've seen Kolsch serves kind of cask condition. I've seen all beer in Dusseldorf serve cask condition. Um, primarily relegated towards ale brewing. If you think about lagers, um, Pilsner and sweet beers, beers that tend to benefit from higher CO2 levels are not going to pair well to cask condition. Cask condition beer is all about subtle levels of CO2. Shouldn't be flat. Should have a noticeable sparkle to it, but the CO2 level is probably only going to be about 1.2, 1.4 volumes, as opposed to an EPA, uh, which is two and a half, or a HIF license, which is three. So, uh, in general, I would say if it's an ale, it will probably lend itself fairly well to cast conditioning. Um, the exception being HIF license, which technically uses an ale strength, but really relies on those really high uh, volumes of CO2. I've seen breweries try to put Hefeweizen in Firkins and literally blow, blow shive bombs, blow keystones. I mean, it's hilarious. God bless them. It's a nightmare to manage in the trade. This doesn't really do a whole lot for the beer. So, yeah, in general, in British and Irish style, it's a pleasure beer. There, there's one brewery in Scotland I know of that makes a cast condition lager. Quite frankly, it tastes more like a lightly hopped pale ale. Um, there's a number of challenges with making what we, we would know as uh, high CO2 lager beer in, in casks. One, they're not designed to handle high volumes of CO2. Um, two, you've, you've got to figure out a way of, of getting that yeast to work at really cold temperatures. 
which means an extended aging period in the cask, which is kind of the antithesis of cask beer in general. I talked about aging cask beer between, say, 50 and 55 degrees. That's where the most flavor um, becomes apparent. That's when the yeast will slowly do its thing and produce some nice esters. If you start chilling down that, that cask to match traditional lagering temperatures, 34, 36 degrees, you might have to leave that, that yeast in contact with that beer in that cask for months at a time. So then you end up with potential other off flavors from the yeast that's been sitting around for too long. You get autolysis, uh, you get all the fermentation, you, you tend to end up with a bit of a mess. So, you know, the beer is called Shihali, and if you're ever in Scotland, if you ever go to Edinburgh, you'll probably be able to find it. It's a nice pint, but to be honest, you wouldn't recognize it as a lager beer. You, know, you recognize it as a cask pale ale. You know, um, it's, 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 cask ale in general is based around the old styles of the most part. What's up there, Lassie? Is there a, a tradition of glassware and cask beer in like how it's served? Or is it still based on style and glass? Uh, it's more based around buildings and foods and whatever you can find at hand. So <laughs> Mason jars, old jam jars. Woo! Nowadays, the standard glass used in the UK is a non glass. Uh, not. Yeah, yeah, this is a straight sided tumbler glass, often known as a shaker glass in the United States, originally used for uh, making cocktails. Um, don't really care for that a whole lot. Uh, any other glasses? We got some smaller. Glasses here. Ah, stem tulip glass. Oh, there you go. Look at how pretty that is. Yeah, you'd never find that in the UK. <laughs> It'd be smashed in some bar fight. It wouldn't last two minutes. Uh, those glasses are traditionally used for uh, higher alcohol cask beers. So if you went to a pub in London and you uh, you're fortunate to find a pint of barley wine on the bar, they'll probably serve it. Uh, into one of those glasses right there. So the 20, 20 ounce Nonic, N-O-N-I-K glass, it's got a roll or a bubble on the side. It's fairly common in the UK. You can stack them. Um, they're also, you can argue that they're also a little bit nicer in terms of foam formation than say a straight sided tumbler glass. Um, in Ireland, you can see a, a, a tulip 20 ounce glass. Um, that's used for more, more aesthetic reasons than anything else. Um, traditionally, Guinness have championed that kind of style of glass. If you go to any of the Irish pubs here in town, you'll see Guinness being poured in a 20 ounce tulip glass. So that's a nice glass you have there. Yeah, that's. Covered in hops. That's, that's a really nice glass right there, especially with the hops on there. Yeah. Um, another glass you've never seen in the UK. Yeah, far too pretty. More for Belgian style beer. So to answer your question, Massey, no, there's no real. Um, glass that's used specifically for cascade. It's more probably based around the style of cascade. So if it's a high gravity beer, you might be more of a stem beer, a stem glass. Um, you might, if you're lucky, get an actual tankard. You know what they call a pint pot back in the UK. So it's a dimpled pint mug with a handle on it. They're horrible to stack, so bar staff hate them. The idea is that you're not actually holding on to the the glass itself, so your, your, the warmth of your hand doesn't influence the temperature of the beer inside the mug. But they've, they've actually gone out of favor over in the UK because they're a bit of a bitch to run through dishwashers, you can't stack them, they're a little bit more expensive to replace, they get nicked all the bloody time over there. Um, so you see the non glasses a little bit more often. But uh, uh, British pop culture is not nearly as advanced as, say, the Belgians are when it comes to specific glassware. Uh, it's getting better, but like ourselves here, we've still got a ways to go to catch up to the Belgians. Yes, sir. What about some of the like adjunct uh, cask things, like, other than dry hopping? Since you oversee like the state's biggest cask program, where some of the fun things you guys have done with non-hop additions to cask? Yeah, it's basically just blasphemy right there. <laughs> Spices and timber and fruit. And... No, it, it, it really. You know, in the UK, cask beer is still very traditional. Um, the additions are usually as exotic as whole leaf hops, that's about it. Uh, but here in the States, um, 
it's one of the great things about American craft brewers is that they are so creative. There's a lot of innovation going on, and they're willing to push the boundaries. You know, um, they, they don't mind. They'll piss off the Germans, the Brits. They don't give a flying fit or who they make fun of. Um, they'll just go right ahead and do it. I think it's great. God bless them. As an Irishman, I love going to town on some of those characters. So. Um, but you're dead right. We, we've done a lot more in, say, in the last year or two at Summit when it comes to um, using fruit, um, spice additions. Um, I, I just had a, a pint of, of cask beer de garde where uh, the brewer Jeff soaked oak cubes of Grand Marnier, added them to the firkin, let it condition for three weeks on the oak, and, and then we served it at uh, Grumpy's Northeast last week. Tremendous beer. I mean, it's it's uh, something that you just wouldn't find in the UK for the most part. So, so you're right. <clears throat> it's not just adding holy pops to the cask. There is a lot more out there. Uh, it just depends on the, uh, on the level of creativity of the brewer, I suppose. You know, certainly at Summit we've 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 kind of moved away from those traditional dry hop additions that we've made and incorporated more spicy. And that's one other addition from last year, too, which I think is good. I think it provides just another level of flavor, and that's what cast beer is all about. So we should try it first. Any other questions? The governor over here. Wondering, um, on Fridays at Summit, you guys have different special ales and so forth. Any? Re can you give us any like sneak previews and uh, like what you got coming up? Of uh, some of your different winter ales with special hops or with special. Well, to, to this, this gentleman's point here, or this question, um, a lot of the winter ales coming up here in the next couple of months um, will have not just some traditional dry hopping involved, but also some um, some spicing involved and some fruit. I don't know exactly what they'll be and when those uh, casts will be available. Uh, you'd have to go on the website to check that out. Um, but we racked 60 firkins of winter ale about two weeks ago, and I'd say about 15 of them were dry hopped. The rest had everything from vanilla to um, fruit additions to spicing to some oak. Um, I've managed to keep the lads from using too much bread and uh, souring the bejesus out of these casks for now. We'll see how long that lasts. But there will be a lot of different variations. Um, the key is that we don't forget what cask beer originally is. It's great that these beers have fruit, it's great that they have spicing, but the base beer should still be pretty solid. You know, this should just kind of bring the level of flavor to the next step. Um, it shouldn't be just about, oh, you know, the boys added a half a pound of nutmeg, oh, it's gonna be great. It should be about, it's a, it's a really nice, well-made cask beer. It's also got nutmeg in it. We have to try and remember that. Damien, did you guys did you guys bottle anything today? Was there any? Uh, did you guys have anything going on? Maybe a, another beer that we might expect to see sometime in the near future. Here? No, I, I drank all of that beer. You don't so, know. Sorry, <laughs> we don't want to discuss it. There's none. There's none left. I don't know what you're talking. About. Um, we uh, we just bottled the uh, the Rebellion Stout today, which is the uh, the newest Union beer. Uh, the Union beer uh, series basically. Uh, takes new and obscure ingredients and, and the job for me is to try and take those ingredients and come up with something pretty unique, pretty interesting. When, when brewers create new beers, the first thing they'll do is they'll get an idea in their head of what the beer should taste like. They'll go, okay, it's meant to be a sour beer, it's meant to be a rye beer, it's meant to be an IPA. And then they'll find the ingredients to match that style, to match that flavor profile. But the union concept is the other way around. I'll go and buy 12,000 pounds of X malt, I'll buy a couple of thousand pounds of X hop, and then try and bring them together. So it's, it's kind of a, I don't know Americans call it, arse backwards, is that, is that the phrase? Uh, it, it's a different approach than you normally take to creating new beers. Um, the first beer in the series was Meridian, which was a, a Belgian ankle came out in, in June, uh, and the next beer is uh, Rebellion, which is based on a, an 1895 recipe from uh, County Cork for a double um, export stout. So, pretty hefty beer, pretty heavily hopped. Um, the base malt comes from County Cork, and uh, it should really age very well in the bottle. It's a pretty assertive stout, so grab some now and put it down to age. Yes, Lex? So, I 
So right now we're, we're uh, coming out with some experimental EPA brews, uh, working with the HPC guys, the hop reading company guys. Um, but for for a lot of these these uh, union or unchained beers, we'll tend to run them. Um, the problem with our pilot system is it's really small, and we have very limited fermentation capacity. So I don't like to tie up one of our two fermentation tanks with an unchained or union beer. Um, if at all possible. We want to try and leave those tanks um, for the really more experimental projects that are in the pipeline. But uh, it is nice to play around with because the brewer is an option to kind of screw around with new ingredients and, and see what happens. So there's always something coming up. I, mean, I, I think we got one, one more question over here and then we'll start. Right. Thanks up. Um, you said that the rebellion stuff ages well, but you maybe just give us kind of a quick maybe do's and don'ts of sour and beer Sure, yeah, yeah. Question related to, to, to cellaring beer. Um, the Rebellion will be bottled, or was bottled, I suppose, with, with a small amount of yeast in suspension. That would be one of the first things I recommend. Don't try and age beer that doesn't have a small amount of yeast in the bottle. Um, so, you know, when you get your bottle of Bass Ale, it's being pasteurized, triple filtered, double centrifuged. Don't age it, drink it the next day after you buy it. Um, there's nothing in there that's going to help the beer mature over the long haul. The second thing is look at the original gravity of the beer. Don't try and mature 4 or 5% beers over a long period of time. They're just not built for it. Stronger beers, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11%. The yeah, Stone Imperial Stout, this fine individual I had earlier. You can age the BJs out of some of those beers. Provided you've got the temperature right. Don't try and age them too warm. And don't age them too cold. They won't do a damn thing if those beers are too cold. The, the actual physical chemical processes that affect maturation of beer, they don't work too well at 38, 40 degrees, which is the standard temperature of, of your fridge probably at home. So, um, likewise, don't age them too warm. The beers will break down a lot faster. Don't age them above 55, 60 degrees. The sweet spot is to try and hit that 45 to 58 bandwidth. It's not easy to do that. I mean, some people have dedicated fridges. Um, it makes it a little bit more manageable, but my advice is don't wander outside of those temperatures if not possible. And ensure that the beer is fairly strong. Uh, but a lot of beer is not designed for aging at all. You, you've got to look at the original gravity and the strength of the beer. Absolutely. Any other questions, comments, criticisms? Hugs and kisses. Come on, give it up. Excellent. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you for all you. very much. You guys have been great. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. I really, really appreciate you guys coming up. What was the purpose of the hammer? Uh, it's to knock some sense into lads like you. Yeah, go for it. some beer. <laughs> what did you guys think of the class? It, it was a lot of fun. It was really interesting to hear about, you know, how the cask, how we do it different here in the UK compared to the US, and how it gives different character to the beer. Did you learn anything new tonight? Well, something, I'm, something I'm not very familiar with. I'd say that, uh, uh, that yeah, in the UK that it's more of a traditional method of serving beer, and I guess that's something I never would have even guessed before. So. It's kind of, kind of cool. I, I just found it interesting because it relates, both of us do home brewing and it kind of relates with that, you know, about how your ca cast conditioning is similar but not the same as, you know, bottle conditioning your beer when you home brew. So it was interesting to hear the, how some Ed and other big companies do that. I really liked it. I love Summit beers and oatmeal stout is both of our favorites. It was good. Yeah. What'd you learn? Um, what did I learn today? I learned about the cask. I mean, like how they use the, the divots and the cask to handle.
handle the settling of the yeast and also the uh, the hops and whatever spices they add. Um, the, I don't know the aluminium, as he said. The, uh, the way the castings form contributes a lot to how it settles the sediment in the beer. Um, I really like that. And um, yeah, I got to smell some good, really, really good mosaic hops. Perfect, thank you. Do you two enjoy the glass?